Now let's talk about the electrocardiogram, and this is located on page 17 of your cardiac dysrhythmia interpretation workbook. And um, so the cardiogram is really uh, electrophysiology at the global perspective. In the last slide presentation, I talked about electrophysiology at a cellular level. Now we're talking a more global level. Important to keep in mind that the ECG represents purely the heart's electrical activity. You know, uh, when cells depolarize or muscle cells depolarize, they contract. So we make a bit of an assumption that when we see an ECG that the heart is contracting as well, but that is really purely an assumption. Important to keep this in mind, that uh, the ECG represents only the heart's electrical activity. Uh, and uh, this is important because sometimes you'll see rhythms where their uh, pulse may be absent. So we can't just assume that if there's uh, a normal ECG that there's a pulse with that. Uh, so it's purely a representation of the heart's electrical activity. Now if we look at the different components, the P wave here represents atrial depolarization. So this is a wave of electrical current across both atria simultaneously. The QRS represents ventricular depolarization. And this would be a wave of electrical current across both ventricles simultaneously. And then we have the T wave, which, which represents ventricular repolarization. And, um, and then the flat line that, that is between the complexes is, re is referred to the isoelectric line or the polarized state. And this, again, you'll recall, is the, the, the time when the number of negative charges inside the cell is equal to the number of positive charges outside the cell. So that's a resting cell. This is just a, a more graphic way of looking at the ECG. So again, the P wave represents depolarization of both atria. And then there's a delay in conduction to the AV node, giving time for the atria to contract and expel its content into the ventricles. And then the ventricles depolarize, giving us the QRS. Then we have the T wave, which represents ventricular repolarization. And then the line in between is the isoelectric line, or the polarized state. So in a QRS, the Q wave is the first negative deflection, the R wave is the first positive deflection, and the S wave is the second negative deflection. And we'll talk about this in a little more detail later, but um, sometimes you'll see a QRS that doesn't have a Q wave, it only has an R wave or an RS wave, but we still call it a QRS for simplicity's sake. So just as um, a bit of a review here, so uh, this line here would be the isoelectric line, so we'll, we'll just call it isoelectric line, right there. Uh, the P wave here would be a representation of atrial depolarization, and the QRS represents ventricular depolarization, so I'm just putting the initials there because it will take me too long to write this, and the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. The intervals are really critical here, and we have to memorize these intervals because they play an integral role in interpreting ECGs, beginning with the PR interval. And we measure the PR interval at the very beginning of the P wave to the e beginning of the QRS. And a normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0 0.20 second. If it's greater than 0 0.20 second or greater than five small squares, then it's prolonged. And that means there's, there's a delay at the AV node or the perinodal tissue. The QRS complex, um, we're only interested in knowing whether the QRS is narrow or is it wide. If it's narrow, then it's less than three small squares or less than 0.12 second. If it's wide, then it's three small squares or greater or equal or greater than 0.12 second. And uh, normally it should be narrow. The ST segment, not so critical in uh, when it comes to ECG rhythm interpretation. It becomes more important when we look at 12 lead ECG interpretation, but that's the um, begins at the end of the QRS and ends at the beginning of the T wave. And then the J point is where the QRS ends and the ST segment begins. And then the QT interval is something that a lot of people don't look at, but I think it's important to look at the QT interval to eyeball it every time you look at an ECG, um, and let me explain why. First, a normal QT, QT interval is one where the uh, QT interval is less than half of the R to R interval. So keep in mind that the QT interval runs from here to here. So that's less than half of the R to R interval. That's a normal QT. A pro prolonged QT is one where the um, QT interval is greater than half of the R to R. And patients with prolonged QT are predisposed to a lethal dysrhythmia called torsade de pointe. And so if you look at QT intervals on a regular basis, you'll recognize those ones that are prolonged. And you can um, document that and inform the emergency department about it. 